Why do we work? That's a huge question coming from an article I read this week from Personality Psychology. And the article articulated this, quote, we wake up, hit the alarm, brush our teeth, wash our hair, eat breakfast, or take a cup of coffee and rush out. Uh, some people wake up, read an ebook or a blog, listen to a podcast, make dumb faces at their pets, say a few mantras, and then head out. Or maybe some hit online for all who work remotely. The nine to five rat race may seem like a gruesome, tedious grind to some, uh, but it provides a sense of stability and comfort to others. Another day marks the start of a daily routine before heading for metro or wheel. Hard work, play hard, Hard work and perseverance are often stressed in success. Overtime and overworking can be seen as a badge of honor in the corporate world. But when can it be detrimental? Maybe we seek rewards in the form of accolades and praise. Maybe we search for purpose and meaning. Does a fine line or gray area exist between the two? Are there universal factor to career satisfaction?" End quote. There are lots of thoughts and lots of ideas regarding this topic about work. And I know for certain that I am just going to scratch the surface for us this morning, but we still linger on the most important question. Why do we really work? Well, biblically, I believe we are called to work wisely with joy to reflect the character of God in Christ. Thus, the main summary statement of this message, work wisely with joy to reflect the character of God in Christ. When we started this series on the book of Proverbs, we went section by section from chapters 1 through 9, which serves as the introduction of this book. Then the book of Proverbs continue with lots of individual collective sayings from chapters 10 through 31. And considering those individual collective sayings, it's a bit challenging to go through the rest of the book chronologically. So what we are trying to do is look at the rest of Proverbs in themes through the remainder of this series. So far, we've encountered how to seek wisdom to meet needs. And then last week, we saw how to be wise with our words, how gracious speech, how to use our gracious speech to encourage other people for God's glory. And this morning, we are looking together on how to be wise at work. I have four points to help frame our time together in the next few minutes. First, I have lies of laziness. Second, warnings of laziness. Third, reason to work. And lastly, diligence to work. Notice first, lies of laziness. I have three lies under this first point, but Listen to Proverbs 6, verse 9 through 11. It says, How long will you lie there, O slugger? Will you rise from your sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an 
armed men. Proverbs 19, verse 24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Proverbs 26, verse 14. A door turns on its hinges. So does a sluggard on his bed. Laziness is a form of sin. And that sin is what these verses reveal. Uh, These verses display laziness as the figure of tragic comedy. It, It is like Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy who has one job of telling people to sleep by touching them. Uh, Laziness is a lie of telling us through life to yawn as God's people. It deceives us with ludicrous sense, which is such a tragedy. Uh, Yes, we are redeemed creatures of God who still have a constant battle of giving heed to lies like laziness, which comes upon us to tell us that we need to lay down and sleep all the time when we should be getting up and being productive to work. Church sluggishness produces many forms of lying tendencies. And the number one lie is that laziness swears to say just a little bit more. That's the first lie we see here. Uh, Let me just hit the snooze button one more time. Uh, Let me just binge watch that little show one more time. Let me just do a little bit more of YouTube. Let me scroll on social media a little bit more. A little bit more is a lie of disregarding what you need to do and saying to yourself, all will be well. And friends, those are lies on top of lies and lies again. Without, without making the effort of doing anything, nothing will be fine. Uh, laziness follows us everywhere throughout life, and it hides beneath the surface. The text tells us it's like a hinge on a door. It drags us down. Derek Kidner captured the idea about a lazy person quite profoundly when he wrote, all he knows is delicious drowsiness. All he asks is a little respite, a little, a little, a little. He does not commit himself to a refusal, but deceives himself by the smallness of his surrenders. So by inches and minutes, his opportunity slips away. Folks, we are called to work wisely with joy to reflect the character of God in Christ. But when we are lazy, we are pressed down and less motivated to do our entrusted duties. It leads us to have small surrenders in life at a time. See, if we give heed to laziness and say a little bit more, we are literally allowing the devil to take a hold of us. Have you ever heard the saying, the devil is busier when we are isolated? When, well, I'm going to add by saying the devil is much more active when we say a little bit more. And my question to you is, are you going to live wisely and be productive for God's glory, which leads to life, or are you going to to live foolishly 
for laziness which leads to death. Saints, please choose being productive for God's glory, for there will be much flourishing. The second lie we see under the banner of the lies of laziness is a lie of saying there's always tomorrow. Proverbs 20 verse 4 says, the sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek to harvest and have nothing. The lie of saying there is always tomorrow is a lie of procrastination. I know farmers might relate to this. If you procrastinate during your harvest season, which is fall, you will end up having nothing because you will miss your harvest. It is like lying down to sleep during the fall and the next time you know it's winter time. And it's too late for you to harvest anything. There will be nothing for you to harvest at that point. I like how Scott Har- Harbert puts it when he said, when the sluggard finally arrived at his chosen tomorrow, uh, the time for plowing and planting had escaped his grasp. How often have we too discovered that tomorrow is too late? The conversation we should have initiated yesterday proves more awkward today. The essay we should have begun last week overwhelms us this week. Uh, The forgiveness we should have sought last month feels harder to seek this month. Autumn has passed. Winter has come, and opportunity has slipped through our fingers. See, procrastination leads to many regrets. When I think about work and everything I seek to do for the Lord and His glory, I always think about uh, one important exhortation a brother once gave me. He said, Eugene, Just put your head in the plow and do what the Lord has called you to do. And putting your head in the plow, he meant just chug along. Listen, work will be great. Assignments can be many. Tasks to be done will pile up. But just to put your head in a plow means just chug along and do the necessary work that God has gifted you to do. You, only, you can only reap what you sow. And if you reap procrastination, you will sow disappointment. So let me encourage you to rise up and plow on. Rise up and do not put stuff off. Rise up and tackle your God-given duties. Saints, laziness is creeping around. We also see a third lie here, which is making excuses. Listen to Proverbs 26, 13. It says, The sluggard says there is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. Uh, John Piper commented on this verse when he wrote, the sluggard creates imaginary circumstances to justify not doing his work and thus shifts the focus from the vice of his laziness to the danger of lions. No one will approve his staying in the house all day just because he is lazy. But they might sympathize with him and approve his staying home if there were real dangers outside. So to hide his laziness and justify himself, he deflects attention away from the truth, laziness, 
to an illusion, lions. Church, our hearts are sinful. And our hearts control our minds and how we think. Our hearts will seek to control our minds and our minds will seek to justify what our hearts desires. Which means that Proverbs 26, 13 reveals a lazy person to be a person who invent ridiculous excuses for not leaving his or her home to go to work. And a lazy person is that person who creates a talent imagination of a lion and a form of work, but he or she is dedicated to have the effort of avoiding work at all costs. Human nature often leads people to justify their sin as if it were the better option, especially in the modern context. Some people might, claim, might make a claim to be afraid that something bad might happen to them. Uh, such excuses are not literally impossible. And they are clearly not reasonable for people to say. Because later in Proverbs 26, verse 16, the wise man declared that the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Lazy people are not stupid. They're smarter than they think. They just choose to be lazy and make silly excuses not to work. In some cases, there might be a tinge of truth to excuses, but that does not exclude it from being a sin of not working to meet your needs and one's obligation. In our culture, there are so many proposed excuses that are meant to deflect shame, which is a great temptation of not wanting to work when we, are, we have the ability to work. Uh, some people indeed cannot work, which is understandable due to the various circumstances. In fact, uh, those who truly cannot work should be supported, uh, should be loved, welcomed, and shown compassion. You, you want to know how that's true? Uh, we heard a whole full message about it two weeks ago. About needing wisdom to meet need among the poor and the vulnerable. Also, some people can't work for whatever reason due to health, which is also understandable. And those people should be loved, prayed for, cared for, and wisely supported. Friends, God never made us to be lazy. Laziness is biblically serious in God's eyes. And there are warnings that derive from being lazy, which we must be aware of. Which leads me to the second point, which is, Warnings of laziness. Proverbs 12, verse 24 says, The hand of the diligent roll, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Some translations reveal this verse like this. Hard work and work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Here's another one. Proverbs 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest you become to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. If you become lazy, be warned that there is potential guarantee of not living well. 
Listen to how Apostle Paul said it in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Food and water will not randomly appear out of nowhere if you don't work. Husbands will feel angst when her wife is lazy. A wife will start feeling angst when his wife, his husband is lazy. Children will whine when their parents are not being actively involved in them, uh, in them during a, their parental guidance. A boss will fire somebody if they're lazing around and not doing their jobs. If you're lazy in your studies, you might fail the test, not unless you're some kind of a genius or something. But you get the point. Proverbs 18.9 says, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. We should be warned and be aware of the consequences of this sin of laziness. Puritan Thomas Brooks profoundly uh, stated about this when he said, by doing nothing, men learn to do evil things. It is easy slipping out of an idle life into an evil and wicked life. Yes, an idle life is of itself evil, but man was made to be active not to be idle. Idleness is a mother's sin, a breeding sin. It is the devil's cushion on which he sits, but the devil's an- and the devil's anvil on which he frames very great and very many sins. Church, idleness leads to much evil deeds. That's why Charles Spurgeon's exhortation is quite relevant for us when he said, work is always healthier for us than idleness. It is always better to wear out your shoes than sheets. That's Spurgeon right there. When we become lazy, We are allowing the devil to control our lives. And I know for certain that the struggle of laziness sometimes cannot become, sometimes cannot be so because you are just choosing to be lazy, even though that's true. You might be the person who is driven to be lazy, maybe because you are always tired. Maybe you haven't structured your sleeping patterns very well. Uh, Some of you are lazy because of your careless eating. Maybe your lack of exercise. Whatever it might be, let me pause and say that I am sincerely very sorry. My prayer for you is that God would carry you through in everything that you're going through in life. May he empower you to get up again to be in active duty for his glory. The warning of laziness is that laziness leads to a curse. But the truth about working leads to a much greater, greater blessing. Folks, I am preaching this sermon with so much conviction right now because I need this word for myself. I need God to help me and free me from my own tendency of being lazy and staying idle. Uh, We all need him. We need him because being a sloth can downplay us in different capacities. 
It can bring us down from having confidence and staying uh, motivated. And I'm here to encourage you by the authority of God's word to work hard. Work hard in everything that you do. Because working hard will bring profit. But too much laziness will bring much shame and relational turmoil. When you are lazy, not only do you suffer, but other people will suffer as well. Work is a gift from God to serve ourselves and others. And if you are in deep struggle with this, please, please pray. And ask God to strengthen your hands and remove laziness away from you. But church, laziness doesn't speak the final word. We still have point number three, which is reason to work. We as Christians, we are people of great hope. A hope that motivates us to get back up and joyfully be productive for the Lord. It is a hope that reminds us through the word of God, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. It is a hope that empowers us to throw off laziness and look to the Lord. And this hope is a hope for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of this gospel, we have a reason to work. Listen to how Jesus puts it in John 15, 17. 17. He says, my father is working until now, and I am working. God is a God who works to keep us by never slumbering nor sleeping. Psalm 121, the passage that Chris read for us earlier, says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor nor the moon by night. God is always at work, mainly because it's God. God is always working in us. He is always working through us. And he is always working for us. He worked for us primarily through the greatest work of salvation, of redeeming unworthy Sinners who deserve everlasting punishment. He did the praiseworthy work of sending his son Jesus Christ to rescue weak, slothful, lazy sinners like you and me. Christians, we belong to the Lord because he is the perfect embodiment of a person who was never lazy. He had a regular job like you and me. He was a carpenter. And oh boy, did he work. He is the incarnate Lord. He could could feast well. He could rest and sleep well. And at the same time, he could cultivate deep and meaningful relationship with many people. The gospel is the ultimate reason for us to work. And not just to work, but to work with joy for the glory of God alone. The gospel of Jesus Christ should be the fuel that encourages us not to 
lean on our sluggishness, but to lean on God's steadfastness. We should be a people seeking to reflect the character of God in Christ. God is the greatest of any worker than anybody in this room, including me. He is the creator of all things. And he is working even now to bring about the created order from chaos. Because darkness came in after the fall, which ruined everything, including making us a lazy people. If God is working, and we are people made in the image of God, he wired us to work to f- reflect that image. And so when you work in your God-given capacities, remember that you are working for God and not for man. Paul in Colossians 3 verses 22 through th- 24 says this, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincere sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. We can strive to glorify God in any kind of legitimate work. Not not illegal kind of work, but legitimate kind of work. Who we work for is more important than what we work for. We We are workers for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our reason to work is the gospel that can shape our mindset to reset reset from the standard of the world and to adhere us to be gospel-centered workers who are diligent to work. Friends, we have a reason to work. Fourth point is diligence to work. Let us look at Proverbs 6 again from verses 6 through 8, which says, Go to the end, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Proverbs 13, verse 4, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. How about this? Proverbs 16, 26. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. Solomon challenged the lazy person to learn from the ants. The little creatures who exemplify hard work and discipline. He applauded the ants for their consistent diligence. And he noted that even even though they have no boss around them to supervise them, they still worked harder than any person who had visible oversight. Don't be that person who is always like, my boss is coming, let me do something. No. The soul of the diligent worker is richly supplied. And the fact that he knows he needs to eat, his mouth urges him to stay consistent. Let me say this. Being diligent can be driven by either doing your work because you love it 
and you enjoy the environment you are in, or doing your work because you love it and you hate the environment you are in. I remember working as a machinist once, and it was by God's grace that I survived there three years. I really enjoyed what I was doing. And this supplied me with a reasonable uh, wage. But the thing is, I didn't love my environment very much. It was very toxic and completely worldly. It was sincerely difficult to keep up with after so long. So even if, if eventually, I had to leave that position. And Bethel, God, let me encourage you, God has called us to be diligent at work, but also to be joyful at work. If you are in toxic workplace, I encourage you to seek wisdom. Talk to one of the elders and pray that God would help you discern if you should leave that job or not. You are not alone. Have joy in your workplace. Diligence to work is also not a guarantee against the future sorrows or disasters of life. Uh, we are called to be wise people who trust in the Lord for the future. And so, being a diligent worker who rests confidently looking to the future while doing what God has gifted you to do with joy and passion, uh, aim to work diligently to supply for yourself, your household, and other people in the community. Diligence to work is a gracious encouragement, but it also doesn't encourage us to be people who, over, who are always overworking. Listen to this imperative from Proverbs 23, verse 4. Do not toil, that's, that's work, to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. The word desist in, in the original uh, language of Hebrew means let up, which actually means cease or abstain. Work is good, but it also can be an idol. Sometimes we need to discern when to pause because God created us to work, but not for work. Don't be a lazy worker, but don't be a worker who is always overworking either. Our true contentment is in the Lord alone. Diligence to work is a realization of knowing that you are working for the Lord Jesus. And he is the only one who can give you the affectionate heart to work, but also to have freedom to rest from your work. To have freedom to serve others. Uh, to have freedom to trust him with your work to have freedom of having joy at your work. Listen, God has gifted us with all bunch of work in all different capacities of life. There is work of parenting, work of a husband, uh, work of a wife. There is work for singleness to serve the church and others. Uh, work of a lawyer, 
work in the church, work as a teacher, a doctor, a farmer, accountant, chef, retirement work, after retirement work, a janitor, a barber, a driver, a student, architect, engineer, pilot, mechanic, administrator, doula, cosmetologist, nanny, the list goes on and on and on. The list is out of this world. He has called us not to be lazy in life, but to work. And when we work, we look to the most diligent worker of all time. The one who never said just a little bit more. The one who never said there's always tomorrow. But he worked while he, it was dead. And he plowed while it was autumn. Not making excuses from the father. He never cried out lying. But worked to enter our many darkness. To come save us. Oh his name is Jesus Christ. What a, what a savior. What a worker. What a Lord that we can trust in, in our work, as we march forth for the God who is worthy of all praise. Bethel Baptist Church, work wisely with joy to reflect the character of God in Christ in this, work, in this world. Because that, my friends, is wisdom at work. Let us pray. Gracious Father of heaven, we thank you for the many gifts that you have given us in our everyday duties. All good and perfect gifts come from you. Would you help us? Would you strengthen us? We confess that we become lazy at times. We are procrastinators. We always say this a little bit more, making excuses. Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us and help us to do what you have given us faithfully to do with joy with passion, with diligence, knowing that we have a reason to work. Help us to fix our eyes on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of the God who has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.